because it took six years for that period. And a lot has occurred in six years. During this period, we hear a lot of lofty ambition in the region as to how we will get greener and cleaner in the production of energy. But are we really moving a pace with what the global standards and our own commitment was to the world and is to the world? And what are the binding constraints that is preventing us from achieving those targets? And are these constraints expected to get better or worse as we navigate the future? These are key questions in answering the question as to the, the, the life, the remaining life of fossil fuel and natural gas. When we have this open and honest conversation, then we will see how lopsided the argument is in relation to the end of fossil fuel and natural gas. You see, the world is in the midst of a global energy crisis, a global food crisis, and a global climate crisis. But at the center of all of these crises lies energy because energy is the backbone through which everything revolves. So what have we seen globally since 2021? We have seen, as the Minister pointed out, COVID-19, the pandemic. We have seen a region where severe climatic condition has brought tremendous challenges We've seen imported inflation for every country in the world, including ours. We've seen the rising costs of energy, oil. Of course, recently the rising cost of gold too, which is good for us in Guyana. But we've seen some strange movements also. While these crises are coming at us like a tsunami. We have seen some strange movement, in my view, not rooted in facts and reality, but rooted in a policy agenda driven by a few countries. We have seen an unwillingness to lend to companies related to oil and gas. We have seen the cost of capital increasing for companies related to oil and gas. And my answer is a very simple one. If you increase the cost of capital and make capital less available to investors, whenever they get the capital to invest, they will also increase the cost of the product because they also have to get back their investment. And who suffers at the end of the day? It is the consumers. It is the people who will suffer. It is all the industries that are supported by the energy sector that will suffer. So we have to have in this room, based on the last question that was asked, very strong statement coming from both the industry and governments that are balanced and rooted in the reality of the world we live in. And those statements must be loud, they must be responsible, but they must be in keeping with the realities that we face as a global community. That is important. The war in Ukraine has compounded the issue that we are faced with today. This region went through energy crisis before. The energy crisis of the 1970s, 
however, cannot be equated to the pressures being experienced today. The energy crisis today is multidimensional, with natural gas, oil, coal, electricity, food security, an important part of the energy crisis, and climate change. According to the World Energy and Consumption Yearbook for 2021, global energy consumption rebounded by 5% in 2021, as compared to the 4.5% fall in 2020. The global primary energy consumption for the year 2021 was 176,431 terawatt hours. The four main sources of the power consumed were oil, 29%, coal, 24%, natural gas, 22%, and hydropower, 6%. This is a reality. This is not guesswork. This is a data. So let's have the conversation as to how we first move away from coal, the 25%. Why isn't that conversation the priority? If coal is the worst form of energy, how do we transition? What is needed to make that first and immediate transition from coal, which is 25%? Where is that conversation? Of course, during this period, record, we had record prices for natural gas. And on that note, for the security of this region, for the energy needs security of this region, I once again reinforce the call that every country in the region with potential in natural gas should be allowed to explore that potential to its fullest aggressively to ensure the energy security of this region. Here in Trinidad and Tobago, that opportunity exists and that opportunity should be allowed to blossom for the benefit of the people of this region and the globe. High energy prices for both developing and developing countries meant what? It meant higher electricity costs, transportation costs, consumable goods costs went up. It contributed painfully to high inflation. Much of our inflation is imported as political leaders and policy makers. We have to face that reality of an inflation that is not as a result of bad policies or measures, but is an inflation that is important, imported as a result of global conditions. This has pushed many families into poverty and food insecurity. It has forced some factories to curtail output or shut down, and it slowed economic growth to the point where some countries are heading towards severe recession. This is the reality of the world we live in, of the region we live in, as a result of an energy crisis. That is plainly what it is. Many times when you think about food insecurity and hunger, our minds automatically are programmed to look at Africa. But if you look at the data now, the Latin American and Caribbean region is becoming the fastest, most aggressive in food insecure region in the world. That is the reality. That is what, that is the complexity of what we are facing. So faced with energy shortfalls and high prices, advanced countries, governments, so we normally hear a lot of the policies that are directed by many of the advanced countries. But you know what they were able to do? They were able to commit over 500 billion US dollars to shield their consumers from the immediate impact of all that I spoke of. That is what they were able to do. They were able to advance 500 billion US dollars to shield their consumers. 
Much of what we face is a result of what is taking place by many of these countries. We face climate crisis, we're worse, we have the worst vulnerability to the climate event. Not even 10% of that, not even 5% of that is advanced of adaptation and mitigation in the region. So what are, we, what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? Are we just to sit back and say, okay, we're gonna go green, and then who's gonna finance the capital? I'm gonna to come to that. In our limited capacity, if you look at the policy measures governments in this region took to cushion the pass on effect of this inflation, it is remarkable by any standard. And I'm not saying this. Read the IDB report and the IMF report. It identifies by country in the region the type of measures we took to limit the impact of this on the consumers. Just, you just have to read the report. And you will see that with our limited capacity, what we have done. In Guyana today, we have no other room to deal with the increases in fuel prices. We have took every cent of tax off. Every cent of tax off. What more? Together with short-term measures, government must take long-term steps, either to increase or diversify oil and gas supply, or look to accelerate structural change. Very simple. So, we are about to implement an energy policy that requires tremendous capital investment if we are to achieve the targets that the region pledge. In an environment where most of the countries in the region are heavily indebted, there is no fiscal room to accommodate this investment. So what we have to focus on is exactly what you did this morning. Government's responsibility is to create the overarching frame, the policy direction, create the vehicle and mechanism through policies and relationship building that enables the private sector to make informed decisions in this energy transition. We live in a region that is blessed with some countries with tremendous potential in resolving our energy requirement. But not only our energy requirement in CARICOM, but if you look at what Cuba, DR, Haiti eventually, and going up the Guyana Shield with Suriname, French Guyana, Guyana, Northern Brazil, it is an enormous opportunity for a holistic conversation on securing our energy requirement for the region along the corridor, both in demand and in supply. And that is the type of conversation and frame that we, I think we have to adjust our minds to. How do we integrate the planning? How do we integrate the thinking? How do we create a structural framework and an ecosystem to support this if we really want to target it as an opportunity? So the Caribbean Sustainable Energy Roadmap and Strategy, which was approved to support the energy policy of the region, sets initial regional level targets for renewable energy contribution to total electricity generation in CARICOM. And what are those targets? 20% renewable by 2027, 28% 20 by 2022, and 47% by 2027. What is the reality? The report card as of 2020 shows that only 11.5% renewable energy was achieved. 
11.5%. So realistically, if we are so far behind the target that was set, and we have all the natural disasters, because one natural disaster can wipe out GDP, you have to go back to more fundamental things. Sometimes you have to rebuild an entire transmission line, transmission uh, system. Where is that capital cost coming from? We have not seen a single announcement by any of the multilateral agency of a window, a financing window to support this ambition. For a matter of fact, you would be so shocked to know that the only known available financing to achieve this target is with CDB with a loan portfolio of 1.4 billion US dollars. This is the reality. This is not skirting around the issue or intellectually tampering with the issue. There's a lot of intellectual tampering with issues that does not fit into reality these days. But we have the responsibility as policymakers to fit things in its realistic environment and construct. So what is the estimated renewable capacity across the region? It is 1.7574, 1,574 megawatts. But what would it require? What is the capital that is required? You're talking about a minimum of 11 billion US dollars to start with in achieving the most fundamental of targets. So we can safely say that in this region, fossil fuel and natural gas has a long future ahead of us. It's, uh, it's not a big scientific analysis that is required. It is based on what is before us. So the conversation is, how do we take this reality in the context of building a global system and world that moves towards net zero? How do we do it? How do we use the revenue to build such a system? How do we reduce our carbon footprint? How do we catalyze the revenue to open up new sectors, greener technology? to ensure that the viability of our countries and the, viabilities, the viability of the people in our countries is also secured whilst we go on the green pathway. We have started to do a lot of that uh, in Guyana. We recently signed an end user agreement in carbon credit sale to HES. So we have to innovate. In this industry today, you have to be nimble flexible, innovative, because the noise can drown you out very easily. The noise can drown us out very easily. So we in CARICOM all have lofty renewable energy targets. But the reality is that the energy demands in our countries continue to rise, and our energy systems are being challenged to meet our growing population centers and appetite for energy services. If you go through <clears throat> all the countries in the region and say, what is your priority in energy now? They will tell you the efficiency in the transmission system. And we can't even raise the capital sometimes to deal with the improvement of the transmission system to give you that efficiency. So while still quite capital intensive, renewable energy will and must be pursued. That will be very clear. There's, this is not an argument against renewable energy. We must pursue every opportunity at renewable energy, and we have tremendous opportunity. So we must pursue these opportunities. However, the intermittent energy sources, such as solar and wind, are being deployed 
at an unprecedented level. But remember that this technology that is being deployed at an unprecedented, unprecedentable, presentable, un, at an unprecedented, unprecedented level. This technology that is being deployed at an unprecedented level does not come foolproof. If you don't believe me, ask those who are trying to get batteries today. Where are the batteries coming from? Where will the replacement come from? What are the natural sources of the battery? And what is the viability of those sources? Where is the assessment of that? Who is doing the assessment? These are questions we have to answer. Because if we build our entire system on solar, and 25, 30 years from now we are faced with these challenges, what are we going to say to the population? These are things for us not to ignore in the conversation. Sometimes when you raise these issues, you are viewed as an obstructionist. But it's not really being an obstructionist, it's looking at the reality. And we have to deal with this reality. And that is what these conferences should do. Deal with this reality and the practicality of the environment in which we operate. So many times one of my disappointment in conferences is that there is no outcome documents. There should be an outcome document that feeds in, that must feed into the global system to tell the global system how the region is thinking, to tell we will get, I think I'm over my time. That is the only way, my dear friend, Dr. Rowley, I'll, I'll borrow one minute from you. In, in, uh, in keeping with our regional strategy of cooperation. So, I just want to end by saying, let this conference be the starting point for our own thinking. Our own thinking and our own positioning. That is important for us as a region. Not the fanciful dance, but the practical steps that will secure us, secure our future, and advance our cause. I thank you and God bless all of you.